Timothy and Tracy Ferreter are a successful couple. They live in the affluent community of Jupiter, Florida. They have four children, including one who they adopted. That adopted child was reported missing. When he was found, he made some jaw-dropping allegations against his parents that he was kept inside an eight by eight box inside the garage of their million dollar home. Inside that box, a box spring, a camera, a desk, and a bucket. The Ferreters have now been charged with aggravated child abuse, and tonight we take a look inside their world to try to understand why this family and why these parents would build a box in the garage for one of their children. I'm Vinny Politan. Thanks so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And this story is one that has you scratching your heads. But I, I want to begin with talking about being a parent. And, and those of us who are parents like me, I've been doing this what, for like 30 years <laughs> of parenting. It's not easy. We know it's not an easy job. It's a labor of love. Um, you do anything and everything you can to help your children, to protect your children, to to give them a chance, right? But there are challenges along the way. And, and for some parents, those challenges are everyday challenges. You know, your child skins her knee. Um, you know, your, your child breaks up with their, with their girlfriend or uh, is having trouble, didn't make the team, whatever it is. Um, you know, stumped with their homework, struggling with, with, with math or geometry, whatever it is. I mean, those are the everyday challenges that we all have that are not easy. But if you have a child that has some, some level of a, a special need, whether it's a, a mental issue, a physical issue, it gets even more challenging. And I think we all appreciate and absolutely understand that. But there is something, though. If you have money, I think the more money you have, the more solutions you have, to some of these challenges and problems. I mean, money helps. It absolutely does. It, it gives you an opportunity to address whatever those issues are and get, get help wherever it's needed, whether it's a, it's a tutor or if it's a counselor, whatever it is you need. If you have, if you have the money, it, it gives you an opportunity to, to find those solutions, a better opportunity to get the help that you need. Because sometimes as a parent, you can't do it yourselves. You need that outside help. Now, let's get to Tracy and Timothy Ferreter, um, who we're going to talk about this hour. Um, from my perspective, they have the means. They have the means uh, to deal with um, these challenges that some people may not have. They're, they're successful. Um, they are, are living a, a, a life that gives them some level of flexibility and the ability to say, hey, if, if we need help with our children, um, maybe we can get someone to help us. You know, if it costs us money, well, we've got the means to do that. So let's, let's reach out and get whatever help we, we need for that child. And this hour, we're going to focus on what was going on down in Jupiter, Florida, where inside their garage was this box a wooden box for one of their children. And I think there's just one really big question that we want to answer here. Why, why, why would you ever think the solution to your problem is building a box in your garage in South Florida and putting a child in it, you know, with a bed, a desk, a camera, and a bucket? Why would that ever be the solution to whatever you are uh, dealing with or, or trying to handle here? And that's what this hour, we're going to try to figure it out. We, we've got uh, people who know a lot about this story who will be with us tonight. We also have a statement from the Ferreter's attorney tonight that may shed some light on that question. Why? Why? Why would you ever do that? Now, for a little more background on this case, Ryan Hughes from our great affiliate WPTV has more on this story tonight. 
Inside the quiet, egret landing community in Jupiter, down the tree-lined streets, and at the end of a cul-de-sac, police say sits a house of horror. This was despicable and shouldn't happen. Inside this garage, Jupiter police say a 14-year-old boy was forced to live in an 8-by-8-foot box with a mattress, a camera, and a bucket used to go to the bathroom. Meals were brought to him, but he was only allowed out, police say, to attend school. Everybody's watching out for each other. So I'm really surprised something like this went unnoticed. But police tell us the teen has been physically abused and confined to the small space since at least 2017. Today, his adopted parents, Tracy and Timothy Furriter, in court, now charged with aggravated child abuse and false imprisonment. I came outside yesterday and seen all the cops and stuff. But, like, I didn't think it was something like that. I thought it was like maybe they got in a fight. Jupiter police say they first came to the home after the boy was reported missing by his mom a week and a half ago. Two days later, officers went back, and once allowed inside, they spotted the small room with a deadbolt on the door. The boy was later found at his school and interviewed. Police executed a search warrant on the camera mounted over the mattress and say thousands of videos were found of the boy locked inside. In court, the couple's attorney argued the teen may have been abused because he has an attachment disorder with his parents. It makes you, my heart go out to that boy, and I hope he's able to find the support he needs. Okay, joining us now in West Palm Beach, Florida, a journalist with the Palm Beach Post who was at a hearing today uh, for the Ferreters, uh, Catherine Kokel is with us. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, you're, you're doing incredible work in covering this story. Uh, I wanted to start first for, for our viewers watching tonight. Can you set the scene for us a little bit about this home, this family, who was living in this house, and what exactly did they find inside that garage? Absolutely, and thanks for having me. Um, Timothy and Tracy Ferreter lived in Jupiter um, and Palm Beach Gardens, both in South Florida from 2004 through 2017. In 2017, they moved out to Tucson, Arizona and, and came back here to Jupiter um, earlier this year, late 2021, early 2022. Um, they were arrested February 8th and the events that led up to their arrest uh, started when their 14-year-old their teenager uh, ran away on January 28th. They were missing for three days and they were found um, on the grounds of their local Independence Middle School um, on January 31st. Um, that was when Jupiter police kind of learned the extent of the alleged child abuse in their home. Um, Tracy and Timothy Ferreter were both born in 1975. They have four children. Um, the 14-year-old teenager we know was adopted. We don't know the circumstances under which that child was adopted um, because those records are sealed. But Tracy told police in Arizona that the child was adopted around two years old. So we know that the child's been a part of the family for a long time. And we also know from the parents and their attorney that they've had some escalating behavioral issues. And so uh, the Ferreters constructed in December a room in their garage. It was made out of drywall. It had um, a wall air conditioning unit, a, a light up top with a um, doorbell camera that was mounted on the ceiling. Um, it was an eight by eight foot room in their garage where the teenager told police they were kept up to 18 hours a day. Um, we believe that this was done as a punishment, uh, but the Ferreters didn't live in Jupiter long before their arrest. Um, we know that they moved back in late 2021, maybe around, maybe in December, and they were arrested February 8th. So they, um, they built this structure right after Christmas, and and then um, the children, all four children that the family has, are now in custody of the state. So, four children. Do we know the ages of the of the children in the in the household? Not publicly, no. That information hasn't been made public. And do we know Do we know if they're younger or older than the 14 year old adopted child? We know that the teenager is the eldest of the four children. They also have a young toddler and then two children in between them. And how about for those of us, well, I've been down there, but for people who haven't been down to Jupiter, I mean, this is a nice community. Absolutely. Egret Landing is not gated. There are many gated communities in Jupiter. Egret Landing is not one of them. But it's an area that's better known for travel sports bumper stickers and children's swings outside homes. Um, you know, I live in the area. It's a place where people walk their dogs. They go on runs. It's just a very normal 
um, very normal affluent suburb uh, of West Palm Beach. So it's known for being quiet, for being serene. Kids play outside. There's a community pool and there are community tennis courts. It's a place where people really feel like a community. And you mentioned that it was the, the ferreters actually are the first ones to call police or law enforcement because the, the teenager, the adopted teenager, actually ran away. So they're the ones who sort of brought law enforcement to their home. That's correct. Tracy Ferreter reported the teenager missing on January 28th. And so that call kind of precipitated the events that led up to their arrest a week later. Um, she called saying that they didn't come home from school that day. The teen was in trouble at Independence Middle School the day before. And so Tracy thought that might have something to do with why they ran away. Um, but police came back to the house twice over the next two days uh, before they, they finally found the child at the middle school. Um, when they did, Tracy didn't want to let them in at the beginning. Police reports show that she didn't want to let investigators into the house to look around. Oftentimes, officers will look at a child's belongings, look for clues of where they may have gone. Uh, she originally said that she didn't want to let police into her home because her husband wasn't there. He was out of town. Uh, but they did uh, talk her into letting them inside just to take a look around. And that is when they discovered the eight by eight foot room in the garage. Um, she originally said that the uh, eight by eight room was constructed as an office for her husband. But then she told officers through a conversation that sometimes the teenager who was then missing um, would use that room. It is worth noting that the room only locked from the outside. So if the child was inside and the door was locked behind them, they couldn't have gotten out of the room. And inside that eight by eight room, my understanding is there were only a, a few items. Was there, there was a box spring. Um, was there a desk inside that room as well? A small desk? There was a, yes, there was a small desk with a folding chair and some um, textbooks, some children's books that uh, investigators believe belonged to the teenager who was missing, as well as the bucket. Um, there were sheets on the mattress as well as a pillow, and the uh, ring doorbell camera was mounted on the ceiling. So you've got the camera on the ceiling, the bed, the desk, and then the bucket. Because presumably if you're locked in there for 18 hours at a time, okay. I, I want to bring in our other, other guest that is, is joining us at, at this moment. Uh, Dr. Judy Ho is with us. She's joining us in Atlanta, uh, not Atlanta, in Los Angeles, California. Clinical forensic neuropsychologist and associate professor at Pepperdine University. Dr. Judy Ho, great to see you. Um, parenting, not an easy job, right? There's, there, there are times where you can get overwhelmed as a parent. You know, if you have one, it's tough enough. If you have two, uh, it's man to man. You've got three or four in the house, you're playing zone, I get it. Um, what, what do you think it would take for a parent to be pushed to the point where, hey, we've got, we've got a, a problem with a child, we need to, put that child into the garage. To me, that is, that seems to be a level of extreme duress or ex I, I don't know how you get there. I'm wondering what's going through the mind of a parent at that moment. Well, Vinny, as a new parent myself, it is both the hardest and most rewarding job I've ever had in my entire life. And I think most parents listening to this, watching this right now would say, there's no reason that I would ever do that to my child. No matter how difficult they become, I'm not going to do something that technically is a chronic form of severe abuse. And I understand that part of the argument here that the lawyer of the family is making is that perhaps this child had reacted reactive attachment disorder. This is a rare disorder that is related to traumas and stresses that the child may have experienced in a very early part of their life, possibly before this child was ever adopted. And that could cause a lot of different difficulties, including behavioral problems, difficulties attaching and relating to the parents. But even so, and you made this point already earlier, these are highly educated and financially resourced parents. They have had this child in their custody for a long time because this child is now a teenager. The manifestations of reactive attachment disorder happen between nine months 
and the age of five. So they've had plenty of time to try to reach out for resources, talk to professionals, find other ways to manage the escalating behaviors. And perhaps they wouldn't have escalated to the point that they did when the parents decided, well, maybe our last resort is just to lock him in a room and give him a bucket to do his business in. I think that there's no good excuse that we can really come up with where they've had all of this time to try to get educated, manage the child's behaviors with professional help. Why didn't they go there? Especially if all of the signs of this type of disorder should have manifested very, very early on, including when they first adopted the child at 17 months. Um, Catherine Kokel still with us, journalist with the Palm Beach Post. Uh, Catherine, how about the, the child, do, do we know, like, did the child have problems outside of the home? Was, were there behavior issues? Were, was the child running into problems with either teachers or administrators or law enforcement or, or with other children? Do we know if any of that sort of was manifesting itself in, in the child's life? Absolutely, it was. Um, the child ran away twice in the two months leading up to the family's move back to Jupiter. And so during both of those times, police reports were made by parents. Um, they had a history of running away. But in a letter that Timothy Ferreter's attorney wrote to the court the day before the couple was arrested, she detailed some of the behavioral issues that were going on with the child. Um, they pushed family members, um, allegedly causing fractures and under other injuries. Uh, siblings and their parents. Um, in Nellie King, Timothy Ferreter's attorney, says that the teenager once attacked another classmate and searched ways for um, people to die on their school uh, electronics. So these issues were kind of manifesting both at home and at school. Some of the other signs that Nellie King pointed to in her letter to the court were that the child was torturing animals and making racist remarks in class. So those were kind of examples that she gave of escalating bad behavior. Um, Nellie King told the court that there was documentation submitted that the child was suffering from reactive attachment disorder. And Tracy Ferreter herself told Jupiter police officers that the child had both ADHD and reactive attachment disorder. ADHD obviously much more common, um, but reactive attachment disorder, just um, as was stated, can can start in early childhood, and and there are signs that these problems were escalating as the as the child grew into teenage years. Okay, we've got a lot more to dive into this hour. Uh, Catherine Kokel is going to stay with us. Dr. Judy Ho is staying with us. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk more about this family, get some more analysis about well, what happens to a child that gets locked in an eight by eight box in the garage? I mean, does that help the situation? I can't imagine it does. Like, how is that a solution? We'll talk about that 